Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Frank, I'm like, I love that intro, but like you oversold me. Because like if I like fall hard, like that's on me. <laughs> okay, I always start off with something funny. Um, so today... You know, I've been studying this whole week, but like I was like super freaking out. Like I had like a like a minor anxiety attack in the back. So then I got out of the room and I'm Jeremy. You know, he's with me and you know, make sure I'm safe. And I was like, Hey, Jeremy, you know, like tonight you're welcome to take over for me. Like <laughs> I wrote the scriptures. Like just take it. I'll be the ghostwriter. Just handle it for me. So he said no. <laughs> so I'm here. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm just super honored and privileged to be able to talk with you all again. I think you guys have really brought me out of my shell, so thank you for allowing me to speak with you guys again. Uh, but here's another funny story. So I drive a lot. I'm like my mom's personal Uber, but gets no payment in return. I have to pay the gas, everything. Like, nope. I win nothing usually out of it, um, but I usually have to take her a lot, like, to the valley or, like, to Pasadena. And, and like, I suck driving in Pasadena because those roads are, like, they lie to you. I'm like, and I GPS it like every time, and it never fails. I get lost every time. I'll be like driving, and I have my mom I'm like, make sure you tell me when the turn happens. And my mom does it, and then it tells me like, right when I missed it, the GPS goes rerouting. <laughs> I'm like, what's the? Cars can drive themselves, but I still get that two second lag on ways. I'm like, go the wrong way, and then I end up just like going in a U turn. And then it takes me like 10 more minutes to get there. And then my mom ends up blaming me in the end. Like, why'd you get me late? Like, why didn't you tell me the turn? And then like, she's all flustered. And then I got to wait in the car and I get lost again. You know how many times this happens like every month. And I'm not kidding you. I'm not over exaggerating. I get lost almost every month. Um, but I think sometimes in life too, we can get lost and we can get rerouted. You know, I think a lot of the times, you know, we want to grow and who doesn't, who, who wants more finances in their life? Who wants, who wants to have that money? You know, who doesn't? You know, who, who doesn't want to do better at their job? Who doesn't want to, you know, you, you have all those opportunities to be better. And I think sometimes in life, we see, we want to grow higher with God, but that also means that we have to get rerouted too. And he does it on purpose. And it doesn't matter how many times you get lost, he always can find a way to get you back. And I know for sure that God has told me to go right sometimes, and I purposefully go left. And then it tells me rerouting. I'm like, nope. And I just, like, lower, like, my phone, and I don't want to listen to God. You've had that moment, too, where you don't want to listen to God. I mean, sometimes he calls us to do things we don't want to do. Like, like today with this. <laughs> I really didn't want to. At first, because I was, like, super nervous. I was like, Dad, like, come on. Like, you could do, like, a video or something, like, from Japan. Sh- I know MTV Cribs or your hotel room like you could, you could have been you like why is it me but I think sometimes God puts us in, in those positions to grow us to mold us into better people and Jesus never promises us to to take us out of those situations that make us uncomfortable I think if anything God usually calls us to those uncomfortable places to really grow you and that's why you know it says where are you and I think you need to ask yourself sometimes in life where are you what season are you in? Where are you right now? And it, and it could be a bad place. It could be a good place. If anything, God doesn't even judge it. I've been in bad places, and I'll own up to it. If you know me, I'll tell you I'm feeling like crap. How you doing? I'm feeling like crap. It's a terrible season, and, like, it sounds really mopey and terrible, but I know I've accepted where I am because I know that there's a Heavenly Father who can help me. So I think sometimes, you know, when God wants to reroute us and to really grow us, he puts us in those terrible positions. One terrible position I remember is when I first started serving in children's. <sighs> I was going to look at Frank. Uh, I started serving in children's, and it was right when I think Frank started taking even a bigger role. So, but the teacher wanted me to do tithes and offerings, and I was, like, freaking out because I used to have a stuttering problem. So I did the tithes and offerings, right? But I stuttered the whole way, and I called on the same kid like eight times. <laughs> I was like, so who knows about tithes and offerings? And then the kid didn't even raise his hand. <laughs> and I still called on him. And I was like, hey. He's like, 
Like, why are you picking me? And that kid, like, he still comes here and he's in youth now. So he remembers it and he puts it in my face a lot. But, like, it was so, it was so uncomfortable and I hated it. But I think it really prepared me for something like this too now. If, if, if someone hadn't seen what was great in me and pushed me in that area where I didn't want to go and I hadn't have failed, I don't think I'd be here. I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with failing. I think we need to realize that we fail forward most of the times with God. He never says, you know, you're going you're gonna to prosper and never make mistakes. Yeah, like, no, I was on the cross. You know, like, no, like, <laughs> he never promised to take you out of the junk. He never promised any of that. If anything, he's building you to, to, to mess up, but it makes you stronger. I don't think you guys believe me. Okay. I like watching documentaries, and I love watching stuff about the Navy SEALs. Um, so pretty much I was watching this documentary, and it was pretty much about how the U.S. water polo team went to go train with the Navy SEALs for a day. You know, because they were training for the Olympics, and they're like, let's just, like, let's just really go all out. Like, we're going to win, but we need to be winners, you know, so why not go to the Navy SEALs? Yeah, and it didn't go their way, really, <laughs> in the documentary. So pretty much, they get there, right? And, you know, you think you're going to get this cute introduction, like, hey, this is the Navy SEALs, you know, who, who, yeah, like this. No, like, he, he told them to line up. He started screaming at them, and then they got, like, these hoses, and they started hosing them down, and these guys just got off the bus. Like, Pfft. You know, like, and he's like, all right, who wants to be a winner? You know? <laughs> and he sends them to the beach. Right? There's a point to all this guy's story. This is just story time. So he sends them to the beach, right? And he's like, all right. So I hear you guys like to swim. Link up. Let's lay in the ocean. So then he put them, like, lined them up on the ocean. Then they had to lay down. But the water was, like, 50 degrees. And he made them lay in there for an hour. And then he's like, he's like whoever, whoever quits, we all got to go home now. Someone quit on me. I dare you. Quit. 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 And the coach is there. And he's like. You know, for the water polo team, he's all shook in the background. And then, like, all the guys are, like, freezing, but they don't want to quit, you know? I mean, it's the first hour. And he's like, all right, no one wants to quit. My job is to make y'all quit. So that he, like, makes them get out in the water. And he's like, take off all your shirts. And some guys are, like, taking their time. And he's like, I said, take off your shirt. And he, like, makes the guy go in the water again. And then he takes them out, right? To, to do burpees. Does everyone know what burpees are? They're like, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, you got it. So he makes the guy do one. And he's like, that took about like 15 seconds. He's like, all right, the whole team has like a minute and 15 seconds to do 30 burpees in unison. And if you miss it, you do more. And then they're like, oh, like this is fine. You know, everyone's like, yeah, burpees. So they all did it, but they all look terrible. Like everyone's going down, one's up. And then he's like, what the heck is this? You want gold and you act like this? Like, no, no, everyone. So like 100 burpees later, they didn't do it right. Like, a hundred, like, he made them, like, do it again. And then he was like, all right, go to the water. So he puts them in the water an hour again. And then he brings them back out, and he's like, all right, do it again. So then they got to a minute and 30 seconds, right? So they're, like, practically almost there. And then he's like, who's satisfied? All of them raised their hands. <laughs> I laughed. Like, I'm at, like, this is, like, at 3 in the morning. I'm, like, watching on my hand, you know? <laughs> I'm laughing, but they all raised their hands. He's like, so you guys are the U.S. water polo team. They're all shivering. They're like, yeah. And he's like, so you're, you're expecting me to cheer for you to get gold, and you're okay with bronze? He's like, yeah, you guys look good as a team on that one, but there's so many teams that work well together, but doesn't, that doesn't make them winners. He's like, so you guys are okay with, with bronze? He's, and then they're all like, he's like, so, <laughs> he's like, so now, Who's satisfied with a minute and 30 seconds? And no one raised their hand. He's like, all right, cool. So who's willing to do it again? And they all raise their hands. He's like, all right, then. Let's just prepare ourselves. Run to the beach and lay in the water for an hour. And then he made them do it, and they did it perfectly in time. And they were tired, right? And then they made them do a course and blah, blah, blah. So they did it, right? And I think sometimes, you know, with that story, kind of related back to us, it costs to be a winner, it pays to be a winner. And sometimes we want to go higher with God, but we're not willing to pay the cost. Sometimes, you know, we like to limit ourselves. Oh, but I'm not, I'm not good at talking to people. I'm not a people person. Um, I, I'm like, that's not me. Like, I'll, I'll do it from here. I'll, I'll pray for you, brother. But I, you go. 
It's like, I just asked you to help me grab something. Like, <laughs> but people will give you excuses. I've given excuses a lot of times. Felicia like does a lot of like stuff here. And I remember when I was younger, she's like, hey, man of God. And I already knew what that meant. Like, hey, you want my help? And I'd be like, hey, I got to go. My mom's calling me. So I made so many excuses. But now I can't. You know what I mean? It's not cute anymore. I'm 20. So it doesn't make sense. But I I came to a place in my life where I just have to stop making excuses. And me coming up here today is one of those those moments. Because I have to stop making excuses. We all have to stop making excuses. If you you really want it bad, you know, because who doesn't want amazing things in their life? God God really, he respects what you want to do, but he cares more about what you want to be. What you need to be. He sees three steps ahead, five steps ahead from you. So, yeah, you could want something now, but he's, he's trying to get you to get out of that mindset of, of limiting yourself, of, of telling yourself you can't. Those who say they can't and those who say they can are usually right. And I think about Jesus. I bring it back to him. Of like he, he, he went on a cross. And he even asked God to take the cup of suffering away from him. Like, that's pretty big. Like, our Jesus, you know, we sing to him all, but even he had a moment. He was like, take this cup of suffering. But, but God didn't take him out of it. He had to endure. And I think we need to recognize as a church that we need to endure. And we need to get back to that place. Like that water polo team, they were all satisfied with, with second best. And I like what the Navy SEAL guy said. He was like, second place is first losers. <laughs> I'm like, dang, this dude doesn't, doesn't give, a, give any, like, slack. <laughs> I'm like, I would have been happy with second place. <laughs> But I think that goes to show with we can't be satisfied with where we're at. We cannot be satisfied. We need to grow more. Can you put up that scripture uh, for me, my first one? Yes. Matthew 5.41, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. See, Jesus already knew. Like He was like telling us like a Navy SEAL, like, go another mile. <laughs> go another mile. If you've made it this far, what else do you have to lose? Really, you've made it this far. What, what's it going to cost you to keep going just a little bit more? Just one more second. Just one more moment. That all it, that's all it takes for you to grow more with God. It's, that's really all it takes. And I think we just, as a church, and I feel like, you know, as Christians, a lot of us, we, we shun those who kind of like feel like they can. They're like, all right, you can't move on. Like, No. The church is meant to be a hospital. We're meant to build people. The Navy SEAL guy after the documentary is like, I was never trying to get them to quit. But he was like, I'm not. He's like, I'm telling them what what they're hearing in their head. He's like, but I'm going to push them to get out of their head. And I think we also, too, here, we have to get pushed past what we're feeling in our head. We have to push past of, of how we're feeling about other people. Yes, not everyone's at the same place as you. Not everyone's at the same place as me. I'm definitely not like my dad. Sometimes, like, when I wrote my message, I'm like, oh, my God, how does my dad do this every Sunday? <laughs> I'm, like, freaking out over a Wednesday. I'm like, dude, my dad does three services, and then when he gets home, he's like, Poof, passes out. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not at the same place as him. You're not at the same place as me, whatever, but we're here to help each other. And we, we're here to push each other. We're, um, iron sharpens iron. So I think if we want to grow into the next frontier with Jesus, if we want to grow as a church, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you. Yeah. And you have to be willing to, to, to take that cost. Because Jesus, yes, he died on the cross for you, and he paid the, paid the price of death, but you have to pay the price of what he did for you too. Yes, it's a free gift, but also too, Jesus wants a little return just to grow you. It's not for him. It's not like he needs you to work. Like, hey, uh, Frank, you didn't clock in from 9 to 5. Yeah, we're going to have to dock your pay. Like, no. <laughs> Jesus is doing it to benefit us. Let's run this race. Let, let's, let's count the cost. Let's, let's grow. No matter how much it, it takes from you. And I, I, and I think, you know, we have to start supporting each other more even as a church. Some people deal with anxiety. Some people deal with, you know, depression. Some people have a lot of things that are going on in, in your own specific life. Financial troubles, blah, blah, blah. God doesn't neglect that, and he doesn't say, oh, like, move past it. No, he's telling you, yes, I recognize how you are. 
but let's go with what you have too. And he takes the negative too. He takes those difficulties in your life, those disappointments, those things that you feel shame about. He uses that to launch you. Pressure doesn't just crush things, it launches things. And I think we have to really acknowledge that as a church and really begin to, to go hand in hand. Like they went, in the, they went on the beach, you know, hand in hand, you know, arms locked together. We should do the same. Let's not leave anyone back. Let's all move forward. I refuse to lose anybody anymore. If you're with me, you go higher. That is my standard. If you're with me, you have to grow. And if you don't grow, then I'm going to still keep pushing you. But there comes a time of, to embrace and a time to let go. But I'll always be on your sideline. But that's how we have to be here. Let's push each other. Let's grow. Let's see these seats filled. Right? We're nine years in, and we can't, we're still trying to get some seats. Let's all unite together. We have a cause. We know a Jesus who, who's ready to save people. Let's do the saving. What, what are we afraid of? If you had the cure for cancer, wouldn't you tell people? Or would you be afraid? What are they going to think about me? No, you're going to save lives. The same is here. It's not the cure for cancer, but I got a cure that can make you feel whole again. I have a God who's the healer of cancer. My dad had cancer. I'm not saying it happens all the time. No, but I had to have faith as a kid. But also, too, had to realize that maybe my dad was going to leave us. He was going to go. But I remember my dad had faith. He used to get so pissed when, <laughs> when the people would come in and, like, read it, read, and, like, the, you know, the priest would come in. Get out! And he'd, like, throw something. <laughs> like, my dad has cancer, but he has enough, like, strength to, like, throw something. He's like, get out! Only, he, and he didn't allow certain people to come in his room because he knew that they'd be like, Pastor Macy, I'm so sorry. He didn't allow anyone to speak anything negative to him. That's hardcore, you know? Like, the man was dying, and he, and he only allowed, like, me, my mom, my sister, and, like, his pastors, and that was it. Like, no one was allowed to visit him because he just didn't want that around him. He refused. He knew how much it would cost. Like, he, he went through so much pain. He didn't even allow doctors to help him to the restroom. My dad's like a monster. <laughs> He was like, no. And like he's in pain and he would walk. Like he knew what it took for him to believe. He, he knew that was something personal for him that he knew that he had to do. It didn't matter how much he was in pain. It didn't matter how much it, it hurt us to see him. And even too, like uh, I would always jump on, his, on him on the bed. And that's like something you don't want to do when someone's like that. He's on the bed and he's, he's like, oh, like and I'm jumping on him. But he's like, I love you, you know, but. He was, he was prepared, and he, and he knew how much it would cost him. And that's why I think I, I look up a lot to my dad, too, because he, that man was dying. But I have a Jesus, too. That's why he sold out, because he, there was a God in heaven who came to him. And that's why he, he, he used to go, even after he got, you know, the cancer and he, and he got healed, he went back to the same hospital and he became the chaplain there. And then he would go and pray for all those people. Instead of having people, you know, prepare them for their death, he prepared them for life and what was to come. That, that's stepping out. That's being uncomfortable. And I think that's what we need to do. It doesn't have to always be like that. Doesn't have, he, my dad's the extreme type of guy. But even just from smiling at someone coming here, just from smiling, asking someone how you're doing, that's what I'm trying to work on with me because I'm great, like, talking, but, like, people, person stuff, like, I can just have, like, a straight face, like, and it looks like I'm mad. <laughs> But, like, I'm learning to, like, get out of that, say hi to people. Because just a second, just, just someone giving you the time of day. Isn't that awesome sometimes when you've had a bad day? Someone's just like, how are you? And they really genuinely mean it. Not like some people who are like, how are you? You know, <laughs> and walk away. Like, those drive-by greetings. <laughs> God bless you, brother. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Wherever you feel uncomfortable, embrace that area. Embrace the discomfort because that's the only thing that will grow you. It really is because we all can cap ourselves sometimes because you, you've, done, you've, done, you've done good, you've been uncomfortable, but then you're going to go to another area that makes you uncomfortable. Never stop growing. Jesus didn't stop. He always... That dude would do random things. Like, he would, like, preach, right? And he's with his disciples. Then he'd just dip on them without telling them. 
what the heck, man? <laughs> like, that's Jesus. He's like, yeah, you know what? Who wants to get saved? Blah, blah, blah. All right. And then, like, gets on, like, the donkey and, like, dips. Like, and then he would purposely make the disciples go a long way. Then he'd do another miracle. Like, that dude would never stop. If I was his disciple, I'd be stressed out. <laughs> like, man, they don't even got GPS then. So, like, they just got to find the wind. <laughs> like, you know, goes more to the east because Jesus is there. I don't know. Like, he kept people on their toes. Like, let's be uncomfortable. Let's step out more. Wherever that is, whatever it looks like for you. If you're not a people person, start saying hi to at least five people a day, genuinely. If you feel like, you know, you're more behind the scenes person, then get on board. Join, join the ministry here. We'll put you in a position that will grow you for sure. <laughs> Trust me. I will personally look at your file and be like, not a people person. First impressions, <laughs> Nicole. Let's go. Seriously, it's, we got to start somewhere. This is a great environment too. Got to start somewhere. And the one thing that I, I love about God is that I've never felt pressured to do something I didn't want to do. He's a gentleman. He'll always show you the way, but it's your choice. He's like a GPS system. The car doesn't just go like, doesn't like make you go that direction. No, it tells you, but it's up to you to listen. And I think of sometimes in our life, we're like, where's God? He's not doing this. He's not doing that. Like, I want to grow more. I want to be better. I want, I want my finances to change. You know, but then you're like not trusting God. You're not tithing. You know, you're spending lavishly when you shouldn't be. Like, there's, there's steps. And sometimes we feel like that God isn't there. But my question to you is, where did you put him? Where was that moment in your life where you decided to leave God? for you, for your anxiety, for your pain, for your hurt, for the rejection. What anyone could have done to you, we've all been in a moment in life where, we, where we've doubted God. I like to say that I do an audit on God every year where I doubt him. But he, he's, he's welcome to it. But sometimes we doubt him so much that we say, you know what, God's dead. And instead of dying to ourselves, we, we, we put Jesus back on the cross and we tell him he's not real because he hasn't shown up for us in the way we wanted to. But I challenge you, go back to that place where you left him. And it may take you some time to think about it, but we all know that one occasion where we really challenged God and we didn't see him show up and then you were just like, all right, forget you, God. You need to go back to that dark place again. It's dark right now because you didn't let God in. Let him in that dark place. He's willing to grow you and expand you, but it, it just takes you. What are you willing to pay? What are you willing to do to go to the next level? It pays to be a winner, but you have to count the cost. You need to go back to that place, however dark it is. You know, I saw this illustration once, you know, because I work with youth, and there was this person, you know, who was talking to us about, you know, how youth, how they go through a lot of things. A lot of youth go through depression now. And, you know, and it starts as kids from what they hear. And then they gave us an illustration of, okay, you see a kid, right? So imagine he's eight, but you're going back through time. So you knew him. He's 14 now. And you knew his life would get worse. But as an eight-year-old, he's like, hey, is life going to get any better? And it's like, what do you say to that kid if you know, like, his life's just going to get harder? Are you going to lie to him? Are you going to tell him that, hey, everything's going to get better? And I was like, no, like, I'm not going to lie to him. So you're going to tell him life sucks? I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that either. He's like, so what are you going to do? And I was like, well... I'm like, I'm going to tell them that there's God. He's like, besides God, not, not everyone wants to hear God. And then I was like, okay, like, what would you tell him? He's like, okay, you know him. He's 14, but now he's eight years old. You're talking to the younger him. It's like, tell him if he can make it that far, he can keep going. Give him just a little glimpse of hope that, that he has a chance to change things. He has a chance, just that small chance that kid can take. I was like, okay. So we started doing that with a lot of our youth. And, like, you, you already start beginning to see the change in the sentence of our youth. Like, some of our youth are hardcore over there. Like, one time this dude tried to fight me. Because <laughs> he was cursing out someone while they were doing tithes and offerings. I was like, dude, like, you can't do that. He's like, what's up? And I was like, what's up? Like, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and George is right there, and he's like, whoa, guys, let's take this outside. <laughs> and then I was like, okay. And I, George knew the kid, and he's like, hey, we don't talk like that. He's like, come on, dog. And then George's like, I thought he was going to swing at him, but he just like went. Like, who does that but then gives a hug? 
I was like, what the heck? She's like, ugh, fine. And like hugs the kid. And I'm like, what the heck? But he was like uncomfortable, but he gave that kid hope. And he's like, you know what? It's not worth it. You're better than this. This isn't who you are. And then that kid calmed down. I was like, what the heck? But he gave him hope. That kid didn't see that in the moment. He was like, F the church, F everybody, and all that. But he gave him a, just a little glimpse of hope. Imagine if George hadn't done that. That kid would have knocked me out. I know that for sure. <laughs> I'm like, this is enough fight. I can win. <sighs> Embrace it. Let's go. <laughs> no, but he chose to be uncomfortable. In every moment you choose to be uncomfortable, you know how many lives you can save in that one moment? I bet he, George saved that kid's life. Imagine if he would have done that in the wrong place at the wrong time, and George hadn't had done that. That kid would be gone. And I think for us, from saying hi at the door, from being nice at your job, from telling somebody you care, all those moments matter. They really do. Can you guys put up my last scripture? John 21, 18. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went where you wanted to go. Leave it up there. Okay, so this is right after Jesus has resurrected and he goes back to his disciples, right? And Peter's back to fishing again. Good old Peter. Good old Pete. All the disciples go back to fishing, you know. Right after Jesus died, they're like, oh, what are we going to do? Let's go fish. Let's just just go back to our nine-to-five job and let's just catch some fish. And then Jesus comes, and then he, like, shows Peter it's him, and then he tells Peter this. So it's like, what what does that mean? Like, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. What pretty much Jesus was saying is, hey, I noticed that every time it gets hard, when you need to go to the next level, you resort to going back to the thing that always holds you back. And pretty much what I'm telling you is, you ain't going to do that no more. I'm going to lead you where you don't want to go. I'm going to dress you the way you don't want to be dressed. And he did. I mean, most of those disciples, they either died for the faith and like one survived, but they all, they all went where they didn't want to go. It wasn't like they were gladly like, shackle me. No. Jesus had to lead them, but they had to pay the price. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. I'm going to lead you where you don't want to go. It may be uncomfortable. It may be like, no, but that isn't me. So what if it isn't you? Just do it. Let him lead you. Give him a chance. Because trust me, if you're complaining now, it's probably because you were trying to do it all on your own. Why not try doing it on the Heavenly Father's strength with your imperfections? And I bet you'll go even farther. Because Jesus always calls those who aren't qualified, really. They're not. I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified. I'm not. But I know that I have a God in heaven who has made me qualified, who embraces my imperfections. He embraces your pain. He embraces the people who have rejected you. He embraces that, that sometimes those, those things that hold you back and that make you feel like you don't want to go any further, he embraces that. And he says, all right, just trust me. Take my hand. I'm going to lead you. And you may not like it at first, but trust me, you'll do more. Imagine if Peter didn't. He was like, uh, I'm going to go back to fishing. So many people wouldn't have gotten saved. There would have been like gaps in the Bible. There would have not, those miracles wouldn't have happened. That's what I'm saying. It matters what you choose tonight. It matters what you decide. It matters if you're, if you're willing to go higher with God. It really does matter. We have lives to save. Let's all get on board together as a church, as individuals. I'm here for you. I'm not just the person that can come up here and talk. I'm here for you. I really am. Take a moment. Take my time. I'm here to encourage you. All, of, all, of, all the people, all the staff, all the volunteers, we're all here to help you. And you're here to help us, to help me. Just like in the back, I was freaking out, you know, for the message. But I just saw all these people's hands raised and it's like dang like that's a lot of faith in the room like maybe I can do it just in those little things you can encourage somebody it encouraged me just seeing people closing their eyes raising their hands having a moment with God that was just beautiful to me I was like you know maybe I can do it it matters guys you matter and and I know 
that as a church, you know, we're called Elevate, but I don't feel like it's on accident. That's who we are. We elevate. We can't help it, but we just do it. We really do. And we want you to join us, really, with us. Let's, let's save lives together. Let's, let's make history. I want to be a world changer, but I can't do it alone. God needs you, specifically you. You, you. He needs every single one of you because you have what I don't have, and that makes you better than me because someone needs a little bit of you, your characteristics. Just someone to be open and say, yes, I'm willing to go higher with God. I'm willing to, to, to be different. I'm willing to let other people know about who this Jesus is. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.